Hello, my name is Dave Millard from the University of Southampton in the UK and in this video I want to explore the relationship between games and hypertext. Let's start with a question, perhaps a ridiculous question. Is The Witcher 3 a hypertext? It seems ridiculous because The Witcher 3 has so many elements we don't see in hypertext. It has a sort of graphical world that you can explore, it has uh, the mechanics of fighting and magic, but it clearly has things in it that seem hypertextual. The relationships between hypertext and games matters. Our ability to understand our games might well rest on our ability to apply some of the theories from hypertext over the years to those games. In this video I want to deconstruct this relationship. I want to think about first of all hypertext as games and then secondly about games as hypertext and see if that helps us understand the relationship any more clearly. So first of all, let's think about hypertext as games. Well, a very common framework for understanding games is MDA, the Mechanics, Dynamics and Aesthetics framework. In this framework, mechanics represent the things you can do, the kind of uh, the Lego blocks, if you like, of the game. The dynamics are how those come together to form some kind of behavior and system. And the aesthetics are then uh, the sort of the, the emotional impact, the experience that the player has uh, when following out that behavior within that system. So in terms of hypertext, let's apply these definitions. So the core mechanic of hypertext is link following, kind of clickable hotspots that take you from one area of text to another. You might think about the dynamic as being one of exploration, of exploring the text and seeing it from different angles. Um, if you have actual agency within the story, like a choose-your-own-adventure, then it becomes more of a puzzle, a kind of a narrative puzzle, where you're trying to get to the ending that you want. And the aesthetic is one of narrative. Um, that's the goal that you have uh, while you're engaging with hypertext. Um, and the experience is, is one of reading. The problem is, is that this really doesn't encapsulate everything about hypertext. It's in some ways quite a naive definition. For a start, Mason and Bernstein talk about different types of links. So the fact that links can be used to time shift or to recurse or to renew or to annotate. And all of these are arguably different types of mechanics. You also get alternative mechanics. So rather than having a link that you follow and it takes you to an entirely new document, you might have links that expand text in place. This is sometimes called fluid links or just stretch text. And here you can see the new text, but within the context of the old. And there are entirely new domains of hypertext where links are abandoned completely. So, for example, in spatial hypertext, the relationships between things are not determined by a link network, but by their proximity or their properties, like their colour or their shape. So this has led people to talk about a new type of hypertext or an alternative type of hypertext, strange hypertexts. Hypertexts which are deliberately playful with their mechanics to get some kind of effect. So examples might include locative hypertext or locative literature, where you read the text on a mobile device and you navigate by moving around the physical space and your location is what triggers uh, new content to be shown to you. Uh, sculptural hypertext, where uh, everything is initially interlinked, so you could in theory move from any one thing to any other thing, but all the nodes have got uh, rules and constraints on them, what Emily Short sometimes calls qualities. And that these mean that at runtime, the system looks at your state and then sculpts away the nodes that you cannot see. Um, and you can also think about um, alternatives. So a few years ago, I was engaged in a project called Fractal Narratives, where we imagined a hypertext system where um, every single connection between a sentence was something you could connect on, um, expanding that connection in place, revealing a new sentence and two new hotspots that you could further look into, kind of creating a, a kind of an infinite chasm of text that you could explore. Now, strange hypertexts are not just things which are limited uh, to uh, what you might see in the, in the literature. Uh, they also appear in, in practice and in the commercial world. So, for example, All This Rotting by Alan Trotter, which is published by Google's Editions at Play, um, is, a, is a textual story. Um, but as you progress through the story, the very text seems to disintegrate, uh, representing the memory loss of the main protagonist. Or you go further, in the app 80 Days by Inkle, you not only have a, a hypertextual story, but you're also navigating around a map of the world. You have a goal, 
of course, which is to get around the world within that 80 days limit. And you collect items, you gather money, and the amount of money you have and the items that you have, well, that determines the sorts of routes which are available to you. And again, even further in Sunless Skies by Fail Better Games, uh, this is augmented by an entire combat system as you patrol the reach in your steam locomotive, uh, taking on uh, pirates um, and augmenting your, your steam engine and, and producing new possibilities. So what we're basically seeing here is that as hypertext becomes stranger, as it begins to experiment with new mechanics and new ways of doing things, it kind of becomes more game-like and moves further away from what we might think of as kind of core literary hypertext. So I think this leads us to a kind of uh, a first conclusion, which is that literary hypertext appears to be a subset of games with a kind of constrained set of mechanics based around textual lexia and link following, albeit one where through strange hypertext, those mechanics can get extended and expanded. So what happens if we look at this problem from the other perspective? What happens if we think about games as hypertext? Well, if you think about something like The Walking Dead by Telltale, here, the text elements are much less important. I mean, the whole game is narrated, and much of the storytelling is done through animation. Um, however, if you examine it, it does have a core hypertextual structure. So, for example, if you look at the way that it's structured, you'll find the classic sort of Bernstein patterns from the late 1990s, which were designed to talk about the early hypertexts. So you'll find things like split joins, where you have a moment of agency that leads the story to diverge and have a unique uh, part but then it comes together again afterwards in order to continue and this is a way to combat the kind of combinatorial explosion of choice that happens and, and the endless content that will be necessary if you allowed it to go unchecked you also see things like mirror worlds where a choice causes the story to continue in exactly the same vein but with one or two minor details uh, being changed even if those minor details are things like which character is alive. Even in games where it appears to be much less um, hypertextual, or the narrative appears to be less interactive, you still find these hypertextual elements. So in The Last of Us by Naughty Dog, uh, Joel and Ellie are going across a sort of post-apocalyptic America. Um, and the story is pretty linear, so all players will see the same cutscenes. They'll all get the same ending. But along the way, you'll encounter NPCs in the environment and you'll hear them talking to one another. And Naughty Dog implemented a kind of contextual dialogue system to make this happen. And it works fairly simply. So, for example, let's say you come across some patrolling guards. Well, there may be nine different things that those guards might say. But the system will look at what you're doing and perhaps you're out of sight and perhaps you're being quiet. In which case, what it will do is kind of sculpt away uh, many of those different choices, leaving the guards perhaps to have an idle chatter about the card game they were playing last night. But if you pop out of cover and start shooting, the game notices that the state has changed, the contextual dialogue system changes, and a different set of things are sculpted away. And now perhaps the, the guards are shouting out about your position, or telling each other to take care. Now my language gives me away here, because this is clearly a sculptural hypertext system. These are basically parts of the story with rules and constraints which determine uh, what can be seen. It's just those rules and constraints are fulfilled by what you're doing in the game world rather than just your interaction with a kind of hypertextual elements of the story. Many times the kind of the hypertext seems to go beyond the game as well. So if you consider Life is Strange by Don't Nod, uh, well if you really want to consider Life is Strange for a start, you have the original game, which was released in a number of different episodes. And then you have prequel games, also released in episodes, that, that came out um, uh, after that first one. And if you want to understand the story, you probably should go and play those, those second and, and third games as well. You also have graphic novels, which carry the story on and tell you about the relationships between those characters and how they develop after the end of the first game. Because they're released episodically, there's all sorts of content that was produced by the company as they were being released, sort of uh, to, to, you know, in terms of marketing, to drum up interest. So that might just be the case for trailers, for example. But you'll see a whole bunch of other content out there as well. You'll see Let's Plays, for example, where people react to the twists and turns of the story. You'll see character studies where people will, will look in depth at uh, some of the, the key uh, figures from the story. And you'll see reviews and analysis where people sort of dissect the story and try to understand what it all means and 
what Date Night were actually trying to achieve. If you look hard enough, you'll even find uh, blog posts by uh, UK academics who probably should know a bit better. The interesting thing about this is that all of this material goes beyond a paratext. Um, it, it becomes much more of a, a transmedia experience. And again, I think that some of the ideas from hypertext apply. So our Seth talks about, talks about the idea of epiphany, where through reading and engaging with a, a hypertext or an interactive narrative, you gain an appreciation both of the story, but also of the, the interactive structure itself and how your agency works within that story. And I would argue that in a game like Life is Strange, that moment of epiphany doesn't actually occur within the game itself. It occurs afterwards when you're engaging with this wider transmedia ecology, this, this hypertext, this hypermedia collection of elements. So none of this really goes against our original definition that literary hypertext is a kind of subset of games. But it sort of shows us that it's not the whole picture and that it misses the key hypertextuality of many narrative games and the place that they hold in this wider transmedia hypertext ecology. So perhaps one of the reasons the question about games and hypertext and their relationship is so challenging is that hypertext are both more and less than games. Now 30 years ago, and in fact again 20 years ago, Mark Bernstein at a keynote address for the hypertext conference asked, where are the hypertexts? Um, he pointed out that if hypertext is so wonderful and so, uh, so interesting, where are the, the big popular hypertext? Where are a million selling hypertext, the cultural bear moths that sort of define our, our culture? Over the last 10 years, we have seen a plethora of brilliant narrative games. And we have other communities that have come up, the game design community, the interactive fiction community, um, that are trying to understand how these interactive narratives work. And I think those communities need to come together. Because Mark Bernstein asked us, where are the hypertexts? And I think now we know. Here are the hypertexts. The hypertexts are the games we play. And our ability to bring our theories together, to understand games in terms of hypertext theory, interactive fiction in terms of game design, is going to be one of the key things that helps us understand how these interactive narratives work. And it really matters, because it's these games that are going to be the defining art form of the 21st century. Thank you very much for listening.